why? No, you're next. I was just sitting there though. Either way. Yeah, you just gotta mix it up. Y'all fucked up. Look, Ugh. we're not professionals, we're tired. Welcome back, Mystery Seekers, to another episode of the Mystery Society. We're all here, all your best friends. Jen is here, Taylor's here, your boy, Nate, is here, and we're here to tell you about all your favorite scary true crime stories. Today, we're going to be talking about Marjorie West. There's a lot to unpack with this story. It uh, may remind you of some of my stories from season one, where they just keep unfolding, and there keeps, it's like more and more testimonies keep coming out. Layers. Layers. Ogres have layers. Onions have layers. All right. <laughs> On the 8th of May, 1938, the West family, which consists of Shirley, who was the father, Cecilia, the mother, and children Dorothy, who's 11, Alan, 7, and Marjorie, who's 4. The five of them were attending church in Bradford, a city south of Buffalo, New York. After church on this Sunday, the West family drove 13 miles along Highway 219 to a clearing in the Allegheny Forest. They joined their family friends, Mr. and Mrs. Lloyd Ackerland. So at 3 p.m., Cecilia, the mother, heads back to rest in the car. Her husband was preparing to go trout fishing in the stream with Lloyd, while the girl, the girls, the girls, <laughs> while the girls Dorothy and Marjorie wanted to pick wildflowers. The girls gathered a bouquet of violets, and Dorothy headed to the car to deliver it to their mother. And as they were walking to deliver the flowers, Dorothy turned around, and Marjorie was gone. Mm, so similar to your other stories. All of these stories, honestly, it just yeah. takes one second. You turn around, you turn back, and they're gone. Uh, the family drove to the nearest phone, which was seven miles away, to contact police in the nearby town of Kane. The next few months saw a tedious search that was staffed by more than 3,000 locals, with many others watching nationally through newspaper coverage. So wow. this was a massive search. It's huge. Yeah, incredible. So, here's how the search went down. On the first day, police didn't find Marjorie, so they called in 200 men. 200 volunteers showed up the first day and started joining. As darkness fell, even more oil men brought headlamps for police and volunteers. Uh, there were some newspapers who were saying things like, every flashlight in the city is being used today to go find Marjorie West. Mm -hmm. So it was an immense search, and you had people who were coming out to search, other people were coming out just to hand out flashlights. It was a very organized operation. At 1 a.m., the rain became too much to bear, so they stopped searching for the night. The next day, the search party grew to 500. They waded through the stream and stood 25 yards apart in a mile-long line. So, a lot of people. Yeah. They were combing through every part of this forest and the stream, everything. Police interviewed motorists in a 300 square mile area. On Tuesday, bloodhounds were deployed and found a few small clues, but these accounts varied. Two newspaper articles say that the dogs found a cabin with its door nailed shut, but nothing of interest was found inside. But other media outlets, uh, which are mainly either direct quotes from Marjorie's um, family members okay. or some kind of like a legitimate account from somebody involved. It said that the dogs followed her scent to a clearing by the side of the road and that's where they lost the trail. Searches found the, or the searchers found the crushed bouquet of flowers picked for her mother for Mother's Day, uh, lying on the ground not far from a large rock. And when they interviewed Marjorie's mother, um, there are some publications that say that she actually told her daughter to be careful around that rock in case there was snakes nearby. Many people believed and still believe that she was taken somewhere near this road. Uh, witnesses reported a few motorists. One was seen um, fleeing in a Plymouth sedan so fast that an oncoming motorist told police that he had to pull into a ditch to avoid him. Oh. Yeah, so somebody may have like picked her up and then just like peeled out to try to get out of there as quick as possible. On Wednesday afternoon, Bradford's mayor called for 1,000 volunteers for the next day's search. Over 2,500 people showed up. Oh my god. Yeah. And like I said, this was a very, very well-organized um, search. And people attributed that to the large amount of veterans from World War I who were living in the town at the time. Mm -hmm. 
it, it was just, you had like natural born leaders pretty much leading one of the biggest searches that ever happened. At 5.30 a.m., surveyors mapped out the land, and by 8 a.m., a line of men standing shoulder to shoulder several miles long grew impatient until leaders gave the signal for them to enter the forest. That's a quote from uh, a newspaper written around that era. Okay. Uh, they also said that refinery workers and corporate men as well worked side by side in the search party while others made more than 1,600 cups of coffee for the volunteers. So you had like really highly paid CEOs and things like that working alongside factory workers and the oil men um, while everybody's wives and um, some of the children in the town were just busy making coffee for everybody and kind of handing them out. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, by the end of the week, 35 square miles had been searched with no signs of Marjorie whatsoever. So far, the discoveries made were a bit of lace near the large rock and a fresh hole a few miles away. But Marjorie's mother said that she hadn't worn lace that day, and two men uh, that were found by police admitted that they used that hole to hide casks of cherry wine. Engineers were busy pumping out a muddy well, and local Native Americans were tracking down mother bears that they believed were prone to carrying off small children in the area. But none of that searching yielded anything whatsoever. They didn't find any bears. Uh, they didn't find anything in the well. Uh, still no clues whatsoever. On the 13th of May, 1938, the state police commissioner, P.W. Foote, told the Associated Press that West's disappearance probably had a lot to do with her affinity to play hide-and-seek. A detail of four police continued searching the area for five months. So even after all of the volunteers went home, they still had people out there looking around That's for- a really long time. A very long time, yeah. Uh, newspapers covering the disappearance linked it with a 1910 mystery where two boys vanished near the forest within a few hours of each other. The boys were hanging out in a large group when they all heard a wild man cursing in the woods and ran. When the group stopped running, they looked to see that one of their friends was gone. 13 miles away, another boy was fishing with his friend. As they're walking home, one of them looked back to see their friend had lagged behind and ultimately vanished. As it goes with pretty much every case in this season. Right. You look away for one second and someone's gone. Uh, the mother of the last boy who went missing spent her whole life waiting for her son to come back to no avail and asked a serial killer if he had anything to do with the disappearance as he had admitted to other murders in the same area. It's terrible. Yeah, so she actually tracked this guy mm -hmm. down um, and I believe she sent him a letter or... Well, this is, what was the, their names? Do you know that? The names of the boys? I don't have it written down, but I can check my sources if you want. Or the name of the serial killer? And, or the woman. So, Edward Adams and Michael Steffen were the two boys who went missing. Do you remember the serial killer, though? J. Frank Hickey, the postcard killer. Postcard killer? She was asking him a lot of questions about her son, and he didn't seem to know anything. Uh, so it didn't really work out for her. Right. Both of those disappearances were under 20 miles away from where Marjorie was taken. Uh, the entire ordeal of Marjorie's case takes place only a few years after the Lindbergh baby disappearance, and only a few years after New York Times writes a headline stating, Kidnapping Wave Sweeps the Nation. Woof. Mm -hmm. That's awful. Yeah. Uh, at this time, kidnapping was seen as a way to make some quick cash. That's sick. Yeah. It's a I rough. don't understand anyone that has that kind of mindset. On September 12, 1950, Tennessee authorities announced allegations that Georgia Tan, the executive director of the Memphis branch of the Tennessee Children's Home Society, had adopted out more than 1,000 babies for $1 million plus dollars since the 1930s, tricking poor couples into giving them up. What? Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. What? Uh huh. Uh, Tan died three days after the investigation became public. What the fuck is happening? Yep. Dang. Many of these children never knew their birth parents, and their wealthy clients must not have known her methods of getting children. Which I think a lot of people probably didn't, because it seems like they're saying, from what I've read, it seems like she did trick literal poor people into giving her their kids for, like, not a lot of money. But there was also a lot of kids who weren't really accounted for. And so you don't know where they came from, which is, I think, why these two kind of get a little bit of a connection. Yeah, that's fucked um, up. Some of the children adopted through these methods include wrestler Ric Flair. What? And one of her clients was Joan Crawford. What is happening right now? What do you mean? Mm-hmm. The, this is like a weird alternate timeline. I know, what? Right? 
It's like a fan fiction. Yeah, that there's no way. That's insane. A few days after Marjorie's disappearance, reports of a man and a young crying girl in a cab going towards Tennessee arise, and police begin to investigate whether they may have been on their way to this orphanage. Jesus. As if somebody may have stolen Marjorie from the woods, put her in a cab, taken her there, and sold her. Yeah. A man and his daughter step forward as the people seen in the cab and say that his daughter was only crying because she became frustrated that they'd had to that they would have to stay the night in town due to the weather conditions. They were going to drive, um, I believe, to another state. I think they were going back to Virginia or something like that. Okay. Uh, weather conditions were just too bad to keep going, so they had to stop, get a cab, and go to a hotel. Since this time, children in the local schools learn about how the elders would search for Marjorie. Um, so the, the search itself is now getting taught in the local schools as like a curriculum. And um, That's so weird. they're interviewing some of the World, World War I veterans and saying, uh, what was it like when Marjorie West went missing? Like, that's how much of an impact this had on this town. Mm -hmm. So this is in um, probably the next 10 years after this disappearance. And there's actually some good quotes that came straight from some newspapers around this time. Uh, the elders told the teacher in the class, quote, there's no way the little girl could have been in the woods. Some of these volunteers mentioned there are many deep oil wells to fall down in the area, but still firmly believe that she was kidnapped. One even adds, I hope she was at least in a good family because this is like 10 years on. So now a lot of people are thinking she was abducted and somehow ended up in a new family to be raised by them. Mm -hmm. So people are just taking the stance of like, well, I hope at least she ended up in a good family. That's terrible. Some of Marjorie's descendants uh, also shared their memories of the situation through newspaper articles and other types of publications. Catherine, the daughter of Marjorie's first cousin, explained on her family genealogy blog, my grandfather searched for weeks long after the manhunt was called off returning home late into the night. Three small children sat on the porch steps waiting for him, but they knew each night from the slope of his shoulders, he didn't find the little girl with the bouncing red curls. Oh Which, God. that's another thing. That's devastating. Let me, let me get you a picture of Marjorie here so that you can be even more heartbroken. Cause she's just about the cutest baby there ever could have been. Oh my God. Yeah. That's awful. Yeah, it's really, really sad. Um, the granddaughter of Dorothy, whose name is Angel, wrote, I remember listening to my grandmother tell me stories about Marjorie and the sadness she felt for leaving her sister alone for those few moments. My grandmother held on to her feeling of responsibility until her passing two years ago. Her grandmother being Dorothy. Right, oh my god. Here's where shit gets a little crazy. I'm sorry, this wasn't already crazy? No, surprisingly, that, that's not even the crazy Jesus. part. Jesus, talking about Joan Crawford? This is the part that is honestly to me completely unbelievable, but this is oh. all this is all backed up. There, there are sources for all of this. Harold Thomas Beck, who went by Bud. <laughs> all right, Bud. He was a writer and college professor with a PhD in linguistics. He researched this case after he heard about it in a bar he used to run. He's kind of like one of us. Just a dude who kind of heard about the case. Yeah. And was like, that's pretty cool. Interested. In 1998, so, it's been a while. It's been a long time. That's yeah. 60 years. In 1998, he posted a $10,000 reward for information about Marjorie. He included up-to-date photos of Dorothy, figuring Marjorie would look like her at this point. One woman contacted him to say she worked at a company in Florida with a nurse who looked a lot like these photos. Beck took a trip to meet several people who he'd gotten tips about, but the only one that stuck out to him was the nurse. He saw the nurse and he was like, hey. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. He said that she absolutely looked like Dorothy, but would not stop denying being Marjorie. Well, Around I mean, she was super young. If if she had been taken and like sold off into another family, like you know, she would have no memory. Yeah, yeah. you know, you're not completely aware of what's happening to you as a child when you're that young, mm -hmm. and especially if like you know the parents had just like insisted her whole life that her name was something else and that they were her parents. Yeah. Ooh, that's scary. So he goes home and kind of cuts his losses. The nurse says that she's not Marjorie. So he goes home, he cuts his losses. Seven years later in 2005, Beck says he heard from her again and she wanted to meet up with him. 
I when, have goosebumps. When he caught up with her, she related a story that her mother told her when she was on her deathbed. In 1938, the nurse's father left that farm and drove north to work in Bradford's refineries for the winter. Come spring, it was time to return to his crops. Driving south past the Allegheny Forest on Mother's Day, he hit a little girl. I'm fucked up over this. Beck said there wasn't anybody there. He was going to take her to the hospital in Kane. He was afraid she was dead. As he drove to the hospital, the girl woke up seemingly unharmed. He and his wife had lost their only daughter that previous winter, but had wanted to try for more children. But the man brought this little girl back to the farm and raised her there. The nurse used to tell her parents that she remembered another family, but they would dismiss it. She also remembered a place with, quote, snow way over her head, Beck says. The nurse only wanted to divulge this information to Beck under the condition that he allowed her to meet Dorothy and didn't publish her story until she died. Unfortunately, Dorothy was in ill health already and couldn't meet up with the nurse. Oh my god. The nurse died more than a decade ago, and Harold Beck self-published his book telling her story in 2010. Beck claims that there is no question in his mind whatsoever that she is Marjorie. Uh, supposedly, this nurse also claimed to be the crying girl in the cab near Tennessee, but this of course conflicts with the man and daughter's story. Yep. Uh, but Beck stands by his story completely, but that book does have a lot of criticism. Really? So, yeah, so I mean, there, there are sources to back up all this happening, but it's really just how much you believe Marjorie about what she said before she died, and then when it all got published, she was already dead. You know what I mean? It, it's kind of hard to sit here and be like, well, of course that's correct. She said that it was her, which she did. She did absolutely. As far as uh, Beck's account goes, the nurse did confirm that she was Marjorie. Right. You know, that she was hit by a car and then raised by that family. I have like no words. That is the most insane thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Oh my God. All of that and, like, you assume that that family that kept her would have heard about the the case just because it was, the whole search was so widespread. Mm -hmm. It was being taught in schools at that point. Yeah. Like, it was so well known. So they would have heard about it. And him knowing what area he was in and exactly what he did would have been, like, shit like well that's that the thing, was me though, is, oh no is they did lose their their child you know yeah. and and that might have been a good enough motivation for them to want another one yeah but it's just like how, can how many how many that? of these mysteries are there is there a person out there who has all the answers and just isn't speaking up yeah. right yeah very very interesting story um and there's a lot more information out there too like this is it, this isn't really surface level stuff. Um, it kind of does give you a good general overview, but there are some good quotes in here if you want direct quotes from people involved. But yeah, definitely check out the source in the description below and you can read through it. It's a very well-written article from The Guardian uh, that goes through pretty much everything that happened, uh, just like this case does, since a lot of the research I did was based off of this and yeah. going back to find what their sources were and, and taking it from that. But yeah, very, very crazy case. All right, guys, thanks for listening to another very, very interesting tale this week. Yeah, it was really good. A lot of layers to that one. Don't forget to tune in next week to listen to Taylor tell you about Glenn and Bessie Hyde for another interesting tale on the Mystery Society. See you next time. Bye.